welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, I know you didn't come to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. I know you didn't come to hear from the old or the young or the the brown, the black, the white, whatever it might be. You came to hear from God. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer because, hey, I need it. I don't know about you. I'm pretty sure you do too, but I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? And let's believe in God for, for a great word tonight, a move of the Holy Spirit. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Lord, we just thank you that we have the privilege and the honor to come into the house of the Lord. Father, there are so many places around the world where people are dying just to read pages or words of your, of your gospel. And yet here we are tonight, freely get to worship, get to celebrate, get to shout without being ashamed. And Lord, we don't take that for granted. Your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, why? Because that's where your presence is. Your word says that when two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. So Lord, we thank you that you are in this place today. We don't come to church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for church tradition or or any other reason, but Lord, we do come to this place to hear from you, and we ask that you would speak to us today. We fully acknowledge that Jesus is our senior leader, and in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us to show us the things in the Word of God, to to bring alive to us the Word of God, that it would be a seed planted into our hearts, into our lives, that we would cultivate that seed of the Word of God, and we would leave this place, and we would bear much fruit for the glory of God. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, we don't ask just upon ourselves, but Lord, upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and really around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers in the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of one body, that is the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. And Lord, we thank you for all of our brothers and sisters around the world, whatever we might call them and whatever church they might attend. We thank you for them. And Lord, we glorify you tonight, Lord. To you be the praise. To you be the honor. To you be the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, And we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I, I, I'm excited for what God's got in store. It's a message that's, that's close to my heart. I think uh, just the, the, the aspect of the Ability uh, as ministers of the gospel to experience this subject firsthand uh, on a daily basis gives us the opportunity to live through it, to see some things. And, and, and I, I just want to share some things out of my heart tonight. Uh, I know that oftentimes one can look at somebody like myself, especially one who's more advanced in, 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 in their life or more, more experienced in life, and might say, well, what does somebody you know, so young have anything to say? And, and, and truly, it's not about my experience. It's about the Word of God. But I, I can say that the, the title of tonight's message is, is Derailing Discouragement. Derailing discouragement. And, and I'll, let me just speak to my own personal life as a minister, as a pastor. Uh, we experience discouragement on such a level, it's amazing how often we get this. And, and, and it's, it's the grace of God that gets us through each and every day. I mean, we go through life and we, we work with people each and every day. And we see them and we build them and we see them growing in the things of God and the excitement and the zeal. Only the next day to see them move to somewhere else or to leave or to say something bad about you. We have friends that we grow up with in ministry and, and, and all sorts of things only to see them walk away or to say things or, or just in, in services we have expectations. I mean, I'll just be open and honest with you. In young adults, we have amazing nights where we got just the excitement of God and we just can't wait to see the momentum the next week and nobody's in church the next week and there's just discouragement after discouragement after discouragement. You know the comforting thing is is that I know even though I'm speaking to the things of ministry I know that I'm not alone because discouragement comes to each and every one of us in a variety of forms in a variety of ways, in a variety of, of methods, in a variety of areas in our life. It's not just, you know, we could say, oh, discouragement comes in our finances, or discouragement can come in our health, or to come in our families. But you know, discouragement comes in every aspect, in every area of our life, regardless of where we're at. We all have to deal with discouragement. The amazing thing about discouragement is, is that as we go through life, I think of it like this, as we go throughout life, we, we're like a train. We gather cars as we gather experience and years become like those cars on a cargo train and the longer we live our life, the more cars we have on that train and the more cars we have on that train. For those of you that work with the rail systems, you know the more weight there is to that train, the longer it takes to slow that train down, the longer it takes to get that train moving. And that's just the experiences of life and such a little tiny thing 
in our life can come and cause us to derail or to get us off track in life. Something so little as discouragement, something so small as a seed or a, a word that somebody said that we should forget, that we shouldn't even pay attention to, but for some reason... We hold on to it, we chew on it, we mull on it, and, it, and it begins to eat away. I remember there was a movie a long time ago, it was a couple years, and it was about a train that, that, that ran away, and it was going towards a metropolitan area, and, and they had to do all these different things, and it was about the conductor, you know, Denzel Washington was the conductor, and, and they had to stop the train, and I remember there was this little thing that they tried to put on the track, they had made a decision to, to purposefully derail the train, and I remember they put this little, this little contraption on the rail, it was like the size of a man's fist and they bolted it to the rails of the tracks so that when the train came it would knock the wheels off the track and it would cause the train to derail and stop. Something so small can cause something so big with so much momentum to stop. And discouragement's the same way in each and every one of our lives. It can stop us. It can knock us off track. It can change the very course in which we live our lives if we allow discouragement to derail us. That's why I titled the message Derailing Discouragement. Why? Because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's a kill-or-be-killed situation. It's a derail discouragement or let discouragement derail me. And I'll tell you something about me and my life with the Word of God backing me and the weight in my train. I know that I've got God on my side, and when that little tiny discouragement wants to be on my track, according to the Word of God, when I apply some things in my life, I can look at that discouragement and say, I'm going to kick you off my track, and I'm going to derail you instead of you derailing me. It's something that we all face. I mean, just something so petty. I remember I, I, I just got back this last weekend from something I've been trying to do for years and years and years. I, I, got, the, I got the opportunity to, to climb to the top of Mount Whitney. Mount Whitney's the tallest mountain in the contiguous United States, 14,500 feet. It was a real thing. It was, a real, it was something I've been wanting to do for a couple of years, and I had been planning... For, for months. It's a permit system. You have to apply to, to try to get on there because so many people try to do it. You have to apply in February, and it's a lottery. They draw your name out of a hat. And so for a couple years there, I've been trying, never got drawn. Finally got my name drawn. So from February up until September, I had been living in anticipation. I finally got my name drawn. And I couldn't wait. My wife, I mean, she'll tell you, she was looking at me like the couple weeks before, just looking at me saying, I can't wait till this thing is over. I am just so done. Here, Pastor Jim, last Sunday night, told him, Pastor, said, Pastor Luke, I don't want to hear another mountain illustration. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor Jim, here it is. <laughs> but the interesting thing was, is it was a week before. It was, it was two weeks ago. Something so petty as a vacation. I was so excited. I was so ready to go. And all of a sudden we went and we hiked to our local mountains up here just to get ready, just to prepare and to see. And I realized that I didn't have the gear that I needed. The gear that I thought I had didn't work. It rained on us and we were miserable and it was a horrible trip. And I started to get a little bit discouraged about my vacation coming up. That was Monday. On Tuesday, we're coming down from the mountain, and we met somebody in the middle of nowhere talking about it, and they said, oh yeah, I just had some friends last week that climbed that, and they had to get dragged off the mountain, and they spent two days in the emergency room because of the altitude sickness. We're saying, okay, all right, you know, we prepared, we're all right, trying to, trying to block that off. Wednesday. Somebody comes up to me and says, oh, did you hear September 3rd? Somebody walked off the mountain and died. And all my family's, you can't go. And then Thursday rolls around and somebody else tells me about their failed experience. And then Friday rolls around and I get a text message from some random person. Did you see the weather? It's supposed to be 60 mile an hour winds and below freezing. By the time the weekend came, it was time for me to get ready to go. I'm looking at my wife like, I don't want to go. I don't want to do this. <coughs> Discouragement, whether it's petty like a vacation or whether it's something serious in life like your child's health, your business, your family, your, your, your income, whatever it might be, your walk with God, whatever it might be, if you allow discouragement to come and stay in your life, it's going to have an effect on you that you're not going to want to live through. You ever heard the statement, when it rains, it Exactly. You know what I'm talking about. And discouragement seems to be one of those areas in life that when it rains, it pours. When somebody says something about you, it's like not just, oh, well, somebody said something bad about you. It's like you got to hear it from everybody who's anybody. you got to hear it from your cousins, sisters, uncles, friends, brother, who you've only talked to once 10 years ago. They call you up and say, hey, I heard so-and-so said. And it's like, where does it come from? 
It comes from all directions. It comes from all angles. And we have got to learn through the Word of God, based on the Word of God, not from a man's experience. That, that's nothing. That's petty. But based on the Word of God, some examples so that you and I can learn to derail discouragement before it derails us. And in doing so, we'll get through life. You know, one of these things about life is that we know we're going to have to go through it. One of these things we know is we can't, we can't run from it. We can't escape it. But if we know how to face it, we know how to fight it, we know how to combat it, we know what the Word of God says about it, then we know how we can be victorious like we talked about shouting today. And we can shout for the victory even though we may not see it because we know discouragement's not going to get us down. So today I've got some things, four things out of the Word of God, looking at uh, how we can derail discouragement. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Galatians. Go with me to the book of Galatians. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Galatia. Galatia is the area, the region that you and I know is Turkey and, and, and Asia Minor right there. And, and Paul's writing to, I remember we did a, a line upon line, precept upon precept, study of the book of Galatians. I loved how Pastor Jim called it the book of realignment. It really kind of gets us and, and, and takes us from where we once were. Somehow we kind of got off alignment and realigns us with the word of God. And here Paul the Apostle is writing. And this is a, an interesting verse. You know, I'm going to be open. I'll be honest with you. If you've been with us on the weekend services, one of the verses that we're going to read tonight, we've seen it twice in three weeks. Two times in three weeks. So, so oftentimes, especially as a preacher, I might look and say, well, that verse has been used. Let's skip over it. But this verse has been on my heart. This section of scripture has been on my heart for several weeks. And I believe that it's God speaking to us about discouragement, about things in our life that we face and how we can combat that and how we can learn to derail discouragement. So based out of Galatians in the sixth chapter, a couple of things I want to share about how you and I can derail discouragement. So starting off tonight, Galatians, the sixth chapter, I'll give you the point, then we'll go to the verse. Galatians in the sixth chapter, number one, for how you and I can learn to derail discouragement when it comes our way, is to stop making comparisons. We have got to learn to stop making comparisons. You know, I think it's human nature. It's ingrained in us as people to look to the left, to look to the right, and to base our success, to base our life, to base our troubles upon the person next to us, on the person that's similar to us, on the person that's around us, upon our family members or our friends. Well, are you going through this? You're not going through this, but, but I'm going through this. Why, if, if, I, if you are, why is it that I'm not? Or why is it that I am and you're not? And we begin to make comparisons. Now, I'm going to give you, I don't think she even knows this, but uh, it's been passed around my family. I'm going to give you words of advice from Pastor Eleanor. Here it is. I might quote you wrong. But whenever you compare, somebody always gets smaller. Whenever you compare, somebody always gets smaller. You see, you're looking at somebody, and you look at their accomplishments or you look at their, their trials and tribulations, and you say, oh, well, thank God I'm not there. They're smaller than you. Or you look at somebody where they're at a similar walk of life, and you say, well, why is it that they're successful? Why is it that they have a bigger house? Why is it that their car doesn't break down? Why is it that their kids are serving God and mine aren't? And all of a sudden now you yourself have become smaller. And see, in comparison, by way of making comparisons to the person to the left of us, to the right of us, wherever we might be in our ways of life, when we make comparisons, somebody always gets smaller. And in doing so, what we are doing is setting ourselves up for more disappointment and more discouragement. So in order for us to derail discouragement as it comes in our life, we have got to learn to stop making Comparisons. Galatians, I had you turn there in the sixth chapter. Looking at verse number three. If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. He deceives himself. Verse number four. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. Verse number five, for each one shall bear his own load. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't look at what somebody else is doing. I remember, uh, I have a family member who's, who's relatively the same age as me. Went through the same things in school as me. And, 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 and remember, we had drove through 
uh, an area that we, we just, my wife and I said, oh man, th th this is an area that we want to live in. We would just, this is like our dream place to live in. And we drove through and it was on this particular day and the sun was shining and we saw this house and the sun was setting on this house and we thought, oh, that is our dream house. And, and it was even on that day, like people on social media were driving up uh, to the area too to go visit the snow and they were like posting pictures of this house and we were like, oh, just someday we want to live in that house. Not a month goes by, and the family member that's the same age as me, that's going through the same things that I am, bought that house. They said, come look at this house we're looking at. We pulled up to the driveway, and we just thought, God, we serve you. We tithe. We're faithful. What is it that we're missing? And you begin to look, why is it this? Why is it that? Why, why God? Why me? Why this? Why not this? They're, doing, they're successful. God, I've been faithful all my life to serve you, and yet I'm not in ministry, but yet this person gets saved, and two weeks later, they're in ministry. And we begin to get discouraged, and we allow ourselves to be fed this discouragement because we are comparing ourselves. When the Bible says, don't look to the person. Don't, you don't run their race. You see, you don't know what that person is going through on the other side. You know, it's easy for us to look at somebody that's in similar stature to us, that has a similar job. It's easy to look to somebody that has the same amount of kids, who makes the same amount of money, that works in the same field as we do. It's easy for us to take something of similar. We, we use the term, let's compare apples to apples. It's easy for us to go look and find the category of another apple and compare it to our life. But the reality is, is that you don't know what that person has gone through in their life. You don't know what that person goes home to. You don't know where they're at in life. You see, you only see things on the outside. You don't know things on the inside. Only God knows that. And so for us to compare based on outward appearance, based on title, based on finances, based on, on material things, is only setting us up to encourage ourselves to have more discouragement in our lives and to become derailed because somebody next to us is moving faster than us. So we've got to learn to stop making Comparisons. God hasn't called us to run somebody else's race. Let me say that again. God hasn't called us to run somebody else's race. The Bible says we run the race that was what? Set before us. You don't run your neighbor's race. You're not even on the same track as the person to your left or to your right. They might be leaps and bounds ahead of you in their race, and for you to compare your race to theirs is comparing an apple to an orange, and you're only going to be disappointed by that. That's why Galatians says, don't look to the people. Anyone thinks himself to be something, he's nothing. He deceives himself. You think you're doing well or you're not when you're really just deceived. Examine our own work, and we'll have rejoicing in ourselves alone and not in another. It goes the opposite way, too. We can make ourselves puffed up. We get ourselves a false sense of pride because then we look at somebody who's going through a season of discouragement. And they tell us, this is what I've been going through. This is the hardships that I've been dealing with. And you start to think in your head, well, I, I, I never dealt with that issue. Or I had that issue and it wasn't as big of a deal to me as it was to, to them. I must be farther off. And all of a sudden, we get this sense of pride. We get this sense of, of, of standing on a pedestal as though we're better than someone else. And like Galatians says, again, we find ourselves deceived. I don't know about you. I don't want to walk about my life being deceived. I would rather know the truth. I love what Jesus says in Matthew, the seventh chapter. You know this. Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse number one. Jesus says, judge not that you be judged. You not be judged. You know, we talk about this with giving, this next verse. Give, and it will be given back to you. Jesus, this is the same biblical principle. This is the kingdom principle. What you measure out is what you're going to be measured with. Whether you give, with the measure in which you give will be measured back to you. Hey, the measure in which we judge will be judged back to us. Jesus goes on to say in verse number two, with for what judgment you judge, you will be judged. The measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Love this. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? Do not consider the plank in your own eye. For how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, there is a plank in your own eye. Jesus goes on to say, hypocrite!
Nobody in this church wants to be called a hypocrite. And here he is making comparisons. He says, listen, you find yourself in that doomed category of Christianity that nobody wants to be. Hypocrite, Jesus says. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's not about what the person next to you is doing. It's not about somebody being elevated before you. It's not about somebody's kids doing better than your kids. It's not about somebody getting a raise before you did, even though you worked harder than they did. It's not about that, because each and every person runs a different race. Each and every person runs a different race, and you and I are all called to run our race. That is the one that God has given to us. It's so easy to look at, look at someone else and say, God, why haven't I been blessed like them? God, why are they so much better at, and then you can fill in the blank with whatever it is you want. God, why did, why did you make Pastor Dan so nice? And not me. <laughs> when we compare, somebody always gets smaller. We've got to learn to stop comparing and focus on ourselves. Maybe it is that the discouragement is coming because there's something in our life that we have issue that we need to pay attention to. And when we compare, we take the focus off our own self and we put it on somebody else like Jesus said. Rather, let's focus on our own work, let's focus on our own race, and let's deal with the issues at hand so that we can better ourselves, so that we can become stronger. So like Jesus said, there might be a day when we say, hey, listen, I went through what you're going through. Let me help you with that little dot in your eye. Instead of saying, oh, look at you. Oh, look at me. No, we got to learn to stop comparing. We're talking about how we can derail discouragement. Number two, number one was stop making comparisons. Number two, how we can derail discouragement. Number two, listen to what builds, not what destroys. Listen to what builds and not what destroys. You know, I'm a firm believer of the statement, what you put in is what you get out. When it comes to food, you eat fried, oh, the goodness, that glorious sunshiny brown or that gold. I love what they call brown golden. That golden brown fried food. Uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? You put something in oil and it's just amazing. You put oil, you put grease, you put sugar on it. Oh, it's so good. But guess what happens when it comes out? I'll be a cobra. Give the reference. There it is. You put garbage in, it's going to be garbage out. What you put in is what you get out. You feed yourself negativity. You feed yourself downing. You feed yourself bad news. You allow that to become what affects you. Let me tell you something. That is what you're going to get out of life. What you put in is what you get out. We have got to learn to, to, to build or listen to what builds, not what destroys. You see, we have the option. Oftentimes to say, oh, Pastor Luke, I, can't, I have no option. Every time I turn on the news, it's bad. Guess what? Don't turn on the news. <laughs> Pastor Luke, every time I drive to work, the guy on the talk radio station is always spewing negativity about the other side. Guess what? Change the radio station. We have the option to choose what we, uh, what we listen to, to what we hear. God has given us something. I'm going to say this again later on. God has given us something that he has given nothing else on earth, and that is intellect. Did you know that? God has given you intellect. You know what that means? Husbands, you know what I'm talking about. That means the ability to selectively hear. God has given, that's right, ladies, God-given ability. Okay, maybe not. There's a guy that we know. Pastor Jim, you know, he's talked about, he's given boats, more boats away than anybody else. He's sold more boats than boat brokers himself. There's a guy that we know, his name's Ian, and he's an amazing guy. Ian is just an inspiration. Ian started out at a company and it was successful when the economy was great. I mean, when the economy's booming, people were buying boats left and right. It was just an easy market. Then all of a sudden, something happened. You and I know the economy tanked. Well, one of the first things that go are vacation homes and boats. And here's this guy. The company that he works for, that's, that's, that's nationwide, that's a, it's a really solid, founded company, goes under. And this guy goes and he starts his own little thing. 
And he just was the most positive. We would go and, how are you selling boats when everybody else is jumping ship, getting into new careers? Yet this guy is sending out emails. Hey, I sold this one, I sold this one, I sold this one, this one's for sale. I'm on his emailing list. Sometimes it's just, stop selling boats. <laughs> we asked him one time, we went to lunch, what's the deal? How is it that you do this when everybody else is jumping ship? And he said, simple. I don't, and he meant it. He didn't say this as a figurative statement. I do not watch the news. It's not on in my house. I don't know anything. You could ask me about the financial crisis, crisis in Washington, D.C. I have no clue because it's not on in his house. Why? Because if he feeds himself negativity, he's going to listen to it. It's going to come into him, and he's going to say, well, this is a downer economy, and I guess my business is going to fail. But rather, he says, no, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to feed myself positivity. I'm going to say, hey, listen, I can do this, and he's doing it. That's just a worldly example. How much more do we have when we have Jesus Christ on our side? Oh my goodness. Galatians, we are there in the sixth chapter. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse number six. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. The New Living Translation says, you should provide for those who have taught you good things. You know what that means? That if somebody teaches you something good, it's worth honoring them for it, which means it's worth listening to. If it's worth honoring... The teacher who teaches you good things in order for you to share the things that you have, what is it then about the negativity? It's worth not listening to. It's worth not honoring. You see, you and I have got to feed ourselves listening to what builds, not what destroys, because we have options all around us. I don't know about you, but bad news sells. Watch the news. Bad news sells. It could be the most amazing story. Oh, so-and-so saved 55 people. Coming up next, five murders in Los Angeles. And that's the story that they focus on. Why? Because that's what people want to hear. We've got to change our mentality. We've got to change our mentality. I love what Philippians says. I'll put it up in the, in the, in the fourth chapter, verse number eight. Philippians, fourth chapter, verse number eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report going on, part B, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Things that build. Meditate on these things. Think about these things. Feed yourself with these things, not discouragement. Because listen, discouragement's going to come at you all day long. It's going to come at you from every which way. It's going to come at you in every area of your life. You don't have to worry about feeding yourself discouragement. It will feed you if you don't feed yourself something else. You have got to make the choice to feed yourself what builds or to listen to what builds, not what destroys. Meditate on these things. I love it. Paul the Apostle didn't just write it. He didn't just preach it. Paul the Apostle lived it. Acts in the 16th chapter. Him and Silas are thrown in prison because they cast a demon out of a girl, took the guy's business away. They're in jail. Acts in the 16th chapter. Verse number 25, it says, At midnight. Okay, first off, if you have a neighbor that does anything at midnight... You're not happy, right? Midnight is a time to sleep. Don't matter if you're in jail. Don't matter where you're at. Midnight is a time to be asleep. Yet here, Paul and Silas, at midnight, look what they're doing. We're praying and singing. Paul and Silas were praying and singing. That would be amazing. That verse add in on its own would be awesome. But look what it says. And the prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas were singing and praying to God. Not just for themselves, but, but they knew that they were feeding those who were broken, those who were lost, those who had no hope, those who had just made bad mistakes. Because guess what? We're going to make mistakes, and discouragement is right on the heels of those mistakes. And yet here they are singing and praying to God at midnight, and the prisoners are listening. You guys know the story. An earthquake comes, breaks the doors, breaks the shackles. I don't know what, what kind of earthquake shakes chains off of somebody's hands, but this is the kind of earthquake that shakes the chains off of somebody's hand. You know the story. The jailer goes to kill himself because he thinks everybody left. But guess what? They were listening to what builds, not what destroys. And so all of a sudden, a voice from the darkness comes out and says, we're still here. Don't kill yourself. And all of a sudden, now the jailer and his family are saved. And the next day, Paul and Silas are released. They didn't have to run in the darkness because they fed themselves. They listened to the prisoners, listened to what built, not what destroyed. Paul and Silas could have sing, oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. 
Nobody knows my sorrow. They could have sang that, but rather they sang and prayed to God. We have the choice to listen. We have the choice to feed ourselves what builds or what destroys. And if we want to derail discouragement as it comes our way, we have got to feed ourselves that which builds. <laughs> Going on in Galatians. How can we derail discouragement? Number three, we've got to watch what we spend our time doing. There is no better indication in life to what is valuable to us rather than other than what we spend our time on. Quiet, because nobody likes to hear that. No, because you know why? That's a self-reflecting statement. You think to yourself, what do I spend my time on? And then you realize that it's television or the internet or, or Facebook or that little device in your pocket. You realize that you should spend more time doing something else. So we have got to learn to watch what we spend our time doing because it's an indication of what is valuable to us. What is it that is valuable to us? We have got to watch what we spend our time doing because we don't get it back. Our priorities lie where we spend our time. When discouragement comes our way, what we are spending, what are we spending our time doing? Listen, when somebody gives you bad news, when you start getting that little ache in the back of your throat, what are you spending your time doing? Are you on WebMD finding out that you're going to die? <laughs> or are you in the Word of God looking at what the Scripture says about healing? You see, what we spend our time doing determines where our priorities are. And we have got to learn when the sign of discouragement comes our way, what is our initial response? Because that will indicate to us where our priorities lie. And when we spend our time building our discouragement or feeding upon the discouragement that is in our life, oh, you're sick, you go to WebMD, your kid has a weird-looking cough or a fungus on their foot, and you look it up. See, what you're doing, now some people say, well, Pastor, look, i got to know what it is. That's great. But your initial reaction should be, hey, let's pray. Not what does WebMD say, because let me tell you what WebMD says. You're going to die. You know it. You've been there before, too. You smash your finger with a hammer. WebMD says you got cancer in your thumb. <laughs> what we spend our time doing determines our priorities. And oftentimes when discouragement comes our way, we spend our time feeding that discouragement. And inadvertently what we do is we set up camp in the valley of the shadow of death instead of walking through it. We don't even realize it. And then we wonder, why is our life not the way it's supposed to be? Why is our life not lining up with the Word of God says? Why is our life not look like the promises of God that we proclaim over our life? Why? Because we realize that we have built a house in the valley of the shadow of death because we have spent our time feeding the bad news, the negativity, the discouragement in our life rather than going to the Word of God, rather than spending our time doing something that we ought to be doing. We've got to learn that what we spend our time doing determines our priority. Galatians 6, chapter, verse number 7. Do not be deceived. There's that deception again. God is not mocked. You know what that means? You can't fool God. We can try all we want. We try. Oh, we try. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You and I have a decision. What are we going to spend our time doing? It's human nature. I don't know about you. I do a lot of online shopping. The internet has changed my shopping life. I, I, I can't wait till I can just have my groceries delivered. Because I like to be in my socks. And so when I go to the Stater Brothers or I go to the local supermarket in my pajamas, you're always there. Pastor Luke! And it's like, oh, I didn't brush my hair today. Even worse, I didn't brush my teeth yet. See, so I do a lot of internet shopping. Some of you are the same way. You know what you do? You look at the, listen, let's just talk. Let's be honest, all right? You look at the reviews like I do, right? It could have 150 five-star reviews. You don't care about those. You don't give a hoot about the five. Some of you are chuckling because you know. You care about what that one person who gave it one star is. Well, I don't know. They all think it's great, but why is it bad? Why is it bad? Oh, you know what? I, I'm not going to buy it. They said it was junk. We do that. We don't care about the five-star review. And who, who cares about the four and the three and the two-star reviews? Those are worthless. It's only that one-star review that really makes a difference in our life. 
And see, we, we feed on that. We feed on the negativity. And so if we spend our time sifting around, finding, you know, they say birds of a feather, feather flock together. If we spend our time trying to find out somebody in our situation, trying to find out somebody going through. You know, I'm, I remember there was a long time before I met my wife when I had another girlfriend and she dumped me. Actually, it was you. I forgot it was you. I had a friend and he would call me up. Long story. He would call me up and he would say, hey, let's go stew about our exes today. And him and I would go and we'd sit and we'd talk about all the great and wonderful, awesome times that we used to have. And now we're lonely and single dudes sitting together crying on each other's shoulders. Why? What good does that do? What good does that do? You see, we have got to watch what we spend our time. We sow in the flesh. We sow our time leading to, dis to discouragement. We feed it. We allow ourselves to live in it. Then guess what's going to happen? We're going to reap in it. What you put in is what you get out. What you put in is what you get out. God gave us the intellect. God made us smart enough to realize that we don't have to live in discouragement. Even though it comes our way, we can get right through it. And that is our decision. That is our choice. Did you know? Oh, oh my goodness. I'm going to get on a soapbox just for a minute. That's why people take to social media. My mama always used to tell me, you know, but, you know Luke, everybody has an opinion, but not everybody has the right to voice it. But now we have social media. Now we have Twitter. Now we have Facebook. Now we have Instagram. Now we have all these different avenues in which we can go online. Oh, my Lord. And we can go online and we can vent. I need to blow off some steam. See, we used to do this in private to God. Now we do it to the public. And we wonder why we're miserable. Did you know that there was a, a study that just came out from the University of Michigan Psychology Department that said the majority of people on Facebook are sad and depressed and discouraged? No joke. I'm not lying. Why? Like Pastor Jim says, and some people, oh, Pastor Luke, I use it to connect with my family. Yes, sure you do. But you see everybody else's gossip. You see everybody else's bad news. You start comparing because they're traveling Europe with their little selfies, and you're at home in your pajamas. <laughs> and we spend time looking at all these other things. We spend our lives and we waste hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of our lives that accumulate to years feeding ourselves with all these things that do nothing to benefit us when discouragement comes and then we wonder why. We wonder why. When we look at our lives, why are we so discouraged? Because you're looking at somebody else. You're comparing. You're feeding yourself with the, the bad news of the internet. You can read about bombings every day. You know, we could get in our car and die just as easy. We can live a life to its fullness by looking at the things of God and celebrating what God has given us the moment we have right now. Or we can feed ourselves with fear and doubt by giving ourselves time to look into these things. You see, it's our decision. God has given us the intellect. I'm going to get off that soapbox. Here we go. You're welcome. Proverbs, the 12th chapter. Verse number 25 says, Anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. Duh. But a good word makes it glad. A good word makes it glad. What are we spending our time? What are we spending our time? You, don't, you can't get it back. You'll never, ever get it back. You'll never, you can get your money back sometimes, or you can earn it again. You can never get your time back. So you've got to watch. I remember in marketing when I was in college, they used to tell us a person with a negative experience would tell 11 other people about their negative experience. But if they have a positive experience, one to two. Oh, yeah, you ate somewhere. Was it good? Yeah. I'm good. Oh, you ate somewhere? Oh, let me tell you about that place. <laughs> See, you know because you've been there. We've got to learn what we're spending our time doing. Got to watch that. Last one, my, I saved the best for last, my favorite one of them all. Here we go. How we can derail discouragement. Are you guys with me tonight? Number four, how can we derail discouragement? Look to the answer that is with a capital A, not the problem. Look to the answer with a capital A. You see, I put the capital A there because if I want to give God the honor, every time I write God, it's a G with a big G. 
Every time it's Jesus, it's Jesus with the big J, even though it's always that way because it's a name. But it's, it's the honor to it. See, God is not just, it's not just an answer like in a book. This is God we're talking about. Look to God. Look to Jesus, the answer, not the problem. Why? The problem will always be there. But Jesus is bigger. God is bigger, is greater. God before us, who can be against us? To derail discouragement, we've got to look at the answer. There will always be giants. There will always be giants in front of our promised land, church. In front of what God's got in front of you, there will always be giants. We have a decision to look at it and be discouraged and say we're ants or grasshoppers in their sight. Or we could say like David to Goliath, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defiles the armies of the living God? Pick up a stone and throw a rock at the giant's head and then cut his head off with his own sword. You see, we have got to look to the answer. It's not us. It's not our ability. It's not our ability to endure or get through it. But rather, it's the grace of God. God. God's ability to get the job done on our behalf that gets us through it. So when discouragement comes our way, I don't look at what the discouragement says. I look at what the answer says. That I am blessed. My family is blessed. My family will be blessed. That this is a generational blessing that my son will grow up to be blessed like I was blessed because my dad served God and his son will. That I'll be blessed in whatever I put my hand to. That whatever I do, I'll prosper. Why? Because I believe that the answer outweighs the problem. This is the verse we've heard. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse number nine. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, meaning make the best of every moment, let us do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. It is our opportunity to share the love of God, to look at the answer when we get the answer, to share that answer with those around us so that we can be blessed and we can be blessed to be a blessing. I love what Isaiah in the 41st chapter says. I'll put it up. The answer. Fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I love how many eyes are in there. Why? Because it's not about our ability. You see, discouragement comes, and discouragement has a way of making us feel like we're the guy in front of Superman or Clark Kent's Daily News holding the world up on our shoulders. Discouragement has a way of making us feel like we are holding the weight of our world on our shoulders when really God says, that's not your responsibility. It's, see, I hold the universe in my hand. It's me who set the earth at its axis and the sun at its rotation, or the earth at its rotation and the sun on its axis. It's me that did all that. You don't have to hold anything. I will uphold you. We have got to look to the answer, not the problem and rely on the fact that discouragement's going to come whether we like it or not. It's going to rain, it's going to pour, but praise God, through Jesus Christ, we have a rain jacket. No, through Jesus Christ, we have an umbrella. No, no, no. Through Jesus Christ, we have an easy up. Forget it. Through Jesus Christ, we have a mansion. We don't have to stand outside in the rain. Why? Because we've got the answer. The answer is God. The answer is Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We are more than conquerors. So when discouragement comes, all we have to say is, listen, I'm going to derail you before you derail me because I've got the answer. You don't. In conclusion, let me say this to you. Let me take you to a verse that makes no sense. Doesn't make any sense. Okay? It's crazy for a preacher to say that. This verse makes no sense. You know why it doesn't make any sense? Because it says it doesn't make any sense. It actually tells us this verse makes no sense. Let's look at Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number six and seven. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made, made, be made known to God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Here's where it doesn't make sense. That the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, you know what that means? It doesn't make sense. To the world, you should not be able to endure. To the people who have no hope, when, when discouragement comes your way, you should crumble like they crumble. When you've got a bad report, when life is, is, is when all hell seems to be breaking, uh, falling loose around you, everybody's going to look at you and say, it doesn't make any sense. And you can say, ah, 
There's a verse in the Bible that doesn't make any sense, but I stand on it. Why? Because the peace of God that surpasses my understanding. Why? Because it's not on my ability. It's not about my ability to make sense of it because God is bigger than I am. God's ways aren't my ways. God's thoughts aren't my thoughts. God's plans aren't my plans. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't know how it works, but when discouragement comes, the peace of God that surpasses my understanding will guard my heart. The world looks at Christians and say, you're crazy. Yes! It doesn't make any sense. And it's not supposed to. Why? Because it's from God. God's bigger than us. God's the answer, the solution. All we've got to do is look to the answer, not the problem. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. We don't look to others. Look to ourselves. Look to God. Don't feed ourselves with negativity, things that destroy, but things that build. Watch what we spend our time doing. Don't scour the internet for reports of what you have or what you do. Don't try to find out somebody or search out somebody that's going through what you're going through, but rather look at the answer, not the problem. And that's how you and I, through the Word of God, will derail discouragement. Did you guys get something out of the Word of the Lord tonight? Listen, let me do something real quick. Let me just give you, uh, let me just say one more thing. Thank you guys, first of all, for staying. For those of you that remain seated, I can't believe how many people got up and left. It's amazing. I just want to encourage you guys. Thank you so much for doing what you've done and staying. Let me ask you a question. It's very serious. You know, see, it would be a travesty for us to get together, hear the Word of God, to celebrate and shout in victory, hear about how to defeat discouragement and derail discouragement, and not give you the opportunity to find out your eternal stance with God. You see, let me ask you this question. I want, to, I want you to just answer within your heart, honestly, openly. Nobody will know this answer really but you and God because it's not about judging somebody else or anybody else. It's between you and God. If you were to leave tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven? Would you find yourself in hell? It's such a simple question. You know, let's go over some of those answers. You know, you might say, well, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope I'm going to get to heaven. I sure want to get to heaven. But you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can think, hope, or want, wish, or will your way into heaven, that you think so, you think so, you think so, you're going to make it. Just by the very fact that you think I hope or I, you think so or you hope so or you want to should indicate to you that you're not on your way. Why? Because if you were, you would know so. You might say, well, you know, I was raised in church all my life. My parents took me to church as a child. Uh, I was called a Christian. My parents told me all my life I was a Christian. I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism. I was baptized as a baby, christened as a baby, whatever it might be. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents took you to church, because you went to Sunday school or any of those other classes, because you were baptized or Christian? Does that mean you're going to get to heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you that you're a Christian? That because you call yourself a Christian, a lot of times we do this in America, we say, I'm a Christian, but, and then add your vice afterwards. We like to give ourselves the title of Christian as though it makes a difference. You see, it's not about what we call ourselves. It's not about what our parents told us we were. It's not about whether the fact we have a cross or a St. Christopher around our neck or we've got a tattoo of a scripture or a Jesus symbol somewhere on our body doesn't mean that we're going to get into heaven. You see, there's more to getting into heaven than just sitting in church. There's more to getting into heaven than just calling ourselves Christian or giving ourselves titles. Say, but Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Did you know that because you're a good person? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God is say that because you never robbed the 7-Eleven, because you don't cheat on your taxes, because you do more good than bad? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Yet so often in America, all we think is that we got to do is all we got to do is just be good people. Let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's not about the outward appearance. It's not about what we look like we do. Like we said today, God is not mocked. Don't be deceived in thinking that because you live a good life, because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven, or you don't drive too fast on the freeway that you're going to get to heaven. Listen, there's more to it than that. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus has a conversation with a man in the, in the book of John in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. Nicodemus had memorized the scripture. Nicodemus had taught in the synagogue or the church of his time. Nicodemus was a good man. He did good things. He gave to the poor. He wore all the right clothes. He said all the right things. And Jesus and Nicodemus, as they have the discussion about eternal life, says that in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. There it is. That's God's way. Hollywood, popular culture, society has made a mockery out of that term. You hear born again, you think of radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something. 
From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. Hey, hey, hey. You've given God all of your life. You see, God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. Why? Because the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not going to get to heaven. The Bible shows us that the devil was able to quote scripture to Jesus Christ. He knows the word of God, yet he's not going to get into heaven. So it's not about your ability to memorize the verse in the Bible. It's not about your ability to know who Jesus Christ is, but rather God wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with him. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ himself is speaking to the church. People like you and I, hearing the word of God, doing good things, and he says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Jesus says if he finds you lukewarm, he will vomit you from his mouth. Wow. Shocking, rude, crude statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and are deceived in thinking they're going to make it into heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define that for you. Think of lukewarm like this, a warm soda on a hot day. In your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's just a little bit up and a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, you're kind of doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing, doing some of your own thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. Hey, you're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Living lukewarm, that's you. And the Bible says that you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. Listen, let me love you enough. Let me respect you enough. Let me honor you enough to not beat around the bush, but to tell you like it is, like the Word of God says it is, if you're living a lukewarm life, you're not going to make it to heaven. Well, how do we get there? You can't get there your way. Hey, we can't get there my way. It's like we can't say, well, all roads lead to heaven. I'll see you there however we get there. No, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. No matter which way you drive, no matter which direction you go, you can't get to the moon. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. You see, it's God's heaven. It's God's way. And Jesus Christ said this. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So listen, let's not do it any other way but God's way today. Through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. So here's what I want to do. In just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity if, if you're in this place. I want to give you the opportunity. If you've never given him all your heart, you've never given him all your soul. I want to give you the opportunity, if you're not sure, to make sure. I want to give you the opportunity, if you've been living lukewarm, today to become the day of your salvation, to ensure your place with God in heaven for eternity, leaving hell behind. You know, you might even say, I don't know if hell or heaven exists. Listen, let me love you enough to tell you the truth. Even though you can't see it, even though you may not feel it or may not believe in it or think that it exists, doesn't mean it's not real. That's like growing up in a place where you'd never seen a semi-truck yet. You stand on the slow lane of the freeway. Guess what? You'll meet one face to face. Heaven's a real place. Hell is a real place. Real enough for God to talk about it. Real enough for Jesus Christ himself to talk about it. Real enough for the Bible to have it preserved over thousands of years so you and I can read about it. It's time for us to take it serious and get serious with God today. So here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible real loud, just like that. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity. If that's you in this place, in just a moment, we'll do it all together. If that's you in this place, I want you to be bold. And what I want you to do is I want you to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my life. I want to make sure I get into heaven today. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll go forward from there. You say, Pastor Luke, I, don't, I can't raise my hand. The person I came with is going to know. I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. Listen, you know what? You might very well be embarrassed, but listen, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for Jesus Christ in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church? The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way, and it's your call. You see, God has already done everything. Listen here. God has already done everything he could to ensure you get to heaven for eternity by giving for your sins his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross. And in return, he wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. The decision's yours. Who should raise your hand if you've never given him your heart? You've never given him your life in just a moment. If that's you, when I count to three, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise their hands if you're not sure? Today, let's make sure. Don't walk out of this place without making sure that's a gamble on your life, your eternal life you can't afford to make. You don't know what happens tomorrow. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you did this as a child or at a harvest or Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through. You did it on television, whatever it might be. Let's make today the day you follow through and make sure you get into heaven. Who should raise their hand finally if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? If that's you, get ready. The moment of your salvation is here, and let's get ready to get hot for Jesus Christ and ensure your place in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. The decision is yours. 
Get ready. I'm going to count to three all over this auditorium from the front to the back. Wherever you're at, if you're outside and you hear the sound of my voice and you know I'm talking to you, stop what you're doing and get ready. In the family rooms, wherever you're at, get ready. This is the moment of your salvation. Don't let it pass you by. Here we go. All over this auditorium, all at the same time. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you right there. Where are you at? Two, I see you right there. Three, four, I see you right there. Five, six, seven, I see you. Seven wise people, eight, nine, I see you right over there. Nine wise people, ten, I see you right there. Eleven, I see you right there. Oh, uh, I got you guys already right there in the back. Eleven wise people, twelve, I got you right here. Twelve wise people, thirteen, I got you right there. I got you guys in the back, I saw you. Thirteen wise people, you say, man, I want to give them, I wonder if I should, I wonder if I should. Fourteen, I see you right there. Got both hands up. Fifteen, I got you. Fifteen wise people. Hey, you're saying, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Listen, it's not me. It's not what a man says. The Spirit of God is moving on your heart. Don't ignore the Spirit of God in your life. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that draws men to, men to repentance. It's you. If God is moving in your life, speaking to you right now, don't miss another moment. Don't wait another second. If that's you, go ahead and pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll go forward from there. Anybody else? Fifteen wise people. Sixteen. I see you right there. 16 wise people. Anybody else in this place, you want to give them all your heart. You want to give them all your life. Let's make today the first day of the rest of your life. Anybody else today? 16 wise people. I'm going to close this up. Your opportunity is closing up. Anybody else? Where are you at, number 17? Oh, come on. Where are you at, number 18? You say, man, I need to take this serious. I need to get right with God. Come on, stop playing games with God, and let's go forward for God today. If that's you in this place, anybody else in this place? 17 wise people. 16 wise people. Where are you at? Anybody else today? Well, praise God for 16 wise people. Hallelujah. God is good. Hey, listen. For those of you that raised your hand, and those of you that should have raised your hand, but you didn't, it's not too late. Here's the deal. What you did by raising your hand, said, yeah, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. If it's important enough for you to raise your hand, let me tell you something. It's important enough for you to take it serious. In a moment, we're all going to stand. And as we stand and Elijah sings a song, I want to ask every one of you that raised your hand, and every one of you that didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If somebody came with you, look at them and say, will you come with me? Or if you brought somebody, look at them and say, I'll go with you. And I want you to get out of your seat as we stand. I want you to get out of your chair and come and meet me here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. Let us pray with you. Let us get some information in your hands. If that's you, as, you, as we stand, please nobody leave. If that's you, come on. You can come. Come meet me up at the altar. Let's change destinies together. If that's you, come on. Yeah, come on. Come, come on, guys. Amazing you, come on. Love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Wherever you're at, come on. Amazing love, how can it be? They're still you coming. We'll wait for you. For come on, you can come. Me. Hey guys, listen, first things first, all right? You can smile. You know why? You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Good day. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy waving over here at you, Pastor Joel. This is Pastor Joel like Noel, but Joel. Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Oh, I promise. Listen, I'm as weird as it gets, and I was in true form today. So you survived me. You got it, okay? He's going to take you right over there. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So we're going to come, and we're going to pray together. He's going to take you and lead you in a real easy prayer. And 
get through that process. Second thing he's gonna do is he's gonna give you some free stuff, some literature, a simple, easy reading that just says, hey, you know what? I just got saved, now what do I do? We wanna help you with that, point you in the right direction. The third thing Pastor Joel is gonna do is he's gonna give you a friend. We give away friends at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer to make sure that you don't waste your time on that exercise equipment that you have no clue how to use. Well, we've got friends, spiritual personal trainers, somebody that will meet with you before church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, sit with you for a couple minutes and teach you for five weeks some of the things of God to get you strong and to build a foundation in the things of God so you don't go back to the life that you're coming from, but rather you start your new life off strong and pointed in the right direction and you'll never be the same. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel to your left, my right. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.